And not so long ago, we all enjoyed the good life in this country. And we gave no thought to the price that we had to pay. It wasn't necessary. The living was good. And now we're into a recession. And there's a price to pay for the good life that we live. I think about 10 years down the road when maybe I have children and how it'll be for them. I've witnessed a lot of needless destruction of wildlife and a lot of trash, things that you wouldn't believe, like uh, an old washing machine out in the bush where, you know, like I said, a, a few years ago, you couldn't even walk out to that area. It was so dense. As a woman, a native person, a native Canadian, as a mother, that it is very important um, to think of our future. And we have rich natural history, natural lands in this area that where we live. And I would like to see it for our future generations yet to come. I want to go swimming. Can't go swimming. Why? 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 The Green Man. What do people forget that, see, the Green Man celebration still happens in Europe, in Germany, in Britain. And there are thousands of carved heads in the churches throughout Europe and Britain where the face <laughs> explodes into leaves all around. And these, these are Green Man carvings. And that's been going on for a couple of thousand years. This is the most important medicinal plant. This is medicine. Do you know that all our medicines come from the plants? Yes. Yes. Do you know where an aspirin comes from? It comes from the willow tree. You find people all over the globe doing something like uh, Margaret Reed is doing. Uh, taking personal care of a piece of the planet. When I stand here looking out over this fabulous panorama, I feel as though I own the world. It's just beautiful. Uh, at least I have had a little bit of control over this uh, 40 acres in the center of Cave Springs. And uh, I can see my, watch my horses. I can see my chickens running around. I can see, um, people as they come up the road to visit me. I can see the school bus as it comes in. Uh, it gives me a tremendous feeling of, um, of power almost over it because I know that they're coming here to Cave Springs, they're coming here to see me, they're coming to see everything that is beautiful, everything that is special, everything that is magic, and uh, I can share it with them. My wife and I, we have a home with three acres of land uh, right on the edge of the escarpment. And we know what it's like to have the trees and the birds and the rocks all around us, where we have the peace and the serenity of the area. We live near Cave Springs, where Margaret makes her home. And we know firsthand the job that she has done with the school kids and the stories of the wildlife and the, the Cave Springs itself. Let's face it, magic comes to you. You don't have to look for it. <laughs> and uh, there's a... Uh, a lot of people that come here say this place is full of vibrations. Because of its location, because of the topography, it lends itself to all kinds of exciting things happening because we have the ice cave, the lost treasure cave, the magic spring, uh, the location of the Indian longhouse, the fact that this was an early loyalist settlement in the 1700s. Uh, people were drawn here because of the magic water and the ice cave, essentially. For a long time, people were not aware that there was anything unusual about the environment because we were in the, the flush of the industrial age. 
Now we're coming back to the pre-industrial attitudes, and we're very sensitive. All of a sudden we've discovered that we live on the planet only by permission of plants. It's the plants that provide our food, our shade, our nourishment. I lived the most hedonistic, feckless uh, existence of an uh, executive uh, yuppie in Toronto. And I lived in a very expensive suburb, and uh, I wouldn't be seen dead going out to the garbage unless my toenails matched my fingernails. It was a very high-level uh, area. And uh, we used to go skiing and uh, motor racing, and uh, we had a boathouse up at the lake with a cr cabin cruiser. We used to go down south, uh, cruising around the islands, and uh, it was a thoroughly selfish life. What encourages me is, is this uh, new awareness, this new sensitivity, this new uh, man putting himself back into nature. I came here to Cave Springs in 1970, in September, and uh, it was almost um, an accident or a series of coincidences that brought me here. Um, I'd lost my home and my business in Toronto, and uh, I was driving to look for somewhere to live where I could look after my horses and cats. Uh, on my own. My husband took off because uh, he couldn't stand poverty and he left me um, literally holding a ten-roomed home. I had to live there for two years on my own trying to um, sell the house and I had during that time the water, the hydro, everything was cut off, they seized my car, everything because we were so much in debt and um, suddenly the house sold and I was left owing $150 which I didn't have. So I was literally left with a, with a bunch of furniture, nowhere to put it, two horses, two cats, and what do I do? So I got in my car and began to head down to sort of looking for my husband, I guess, see if he'd give me some money. Never found him. <laughs> a real estate agent drove me around looking for somewhere to um, rent, and uh, we arrived at Cave Springs. I looked over at this building here, which was up to its neck in weeds, everything broken and smashed. I said, what about that? And he said, you can't have it, it's condemned. So I said, I'll take it. Because I felt I was condemned and <laughs> disoriented and uh, derelict. So we sort of came together as a couple, Cave Springs and me, just at that moment. And very soon after that, I realized that I had been definitely brought here by metaphysical forces to, to save this place because I very soon found out how special it was. This is what I call the sun room. This is another one of my favorite rooms. This was a building that was lying around on the property. It was probably a chicken house, a woodshed, and at one time it was over top of the waste scales. I think the most valuable asset of this uh, property is, is, is the location more than anything else. From my window, I can see the entire Toronto skyline right from um, Hamilton Harbour round to um, Frenchman's Bay. I started with uh, uh, this empty barn with no windows, no doors, nothing uh, that locked or opened or closed, no insulation, no heating, and um, there was a spring apparently up the mountain but someone told me, if you connect that up, it'll run into this single tap that was in the house. There was a tap in the house, but no sink, no drain, no cupboards, nothing. And it was filled up to, literally to my waist on both floors, with garbage. And I lived here for a year like that, with absolutely no plumbing, no insulation, no heating. I was cold, I was hungry, and uh, it was pretty scary. But I realized right then that here I am. I'm a person, I'm an individual. Um, I'm not dead, so it's cold, so what? A lot, lot of people are in much worse, con worse condition than that. I sometimes think of the desiderata, you know, that says, you are a child of the universe. No less than the stars and the trees, you have a right to be here. And whether or not it is clear to you, 
No doubt the universe is unfolding as it should. So it was really a lot of fun because all the local people who heard about me thought I was a little bit crazy. There's that idiot woman who's moved in there. She's got an MG, Siamese cats and Arabian horses. And she's obviously got no money because she's got no plumbing or anything there. And they all used to come up to sort of peer at me and <laughs> say, are you still here? <laughs> and they had bets in the town that I wouldn't be able to go through the winter. I've known Margaret for a while, and, and uh, I've really admired her. She's, she's the perfect example of, of how one person can make a difference. And she's just so determined to preserve Cave Springs. You know, she's little, but she's feisty, and she's ruffled a bunch of feathers on her, on her way. Well, because of my uh, uh, struggle and protests to uh, protect this area, uh, I've become known as the Witch of Cave Springs. Uh, this was started by one particular reporter who um, wanted to know what people thought about me because I was trying to protect this area and I was trying to stop development. I was going to the NEC uh, protest um, meetings, etc. And uh, over the years, all the other newspapers have caught on the idea of the Witch of Cave Springs because it sells newspapers, doesn't it? And as far as I'm concerned, um, if it attracts people to Cave Springs and uh, brings them here in quest of finding out what it's all about, then calling me a witch doesn't matter because witches are not necessarily bad anyway. Uh, witches are uh, enchant. There are many people, and I think of a series of, of individuals. One would be Margaret Reed at Cave Springs. And what, what do you suppose her motivation is? Uh, I, I would say it's, it's her realization that uh, we've interfered with nature too much. Now let's not interfere. Let's, let's let nature take some parts of the planet, some areas, and do what she wants to do with them. Never mind what we want to do with them. And that, that's a noble, a noble effort. I bought it for $16,500, nearly 11 acres. But it takes in the side of the escarpment and acreage on top. And this is the important thing, that it's not just a piece of flat land down here. It's this whole special escarpment thing. Within a very few months, I realized how very important this uh, property was because uh, apart from the fact that thousands of people seem to want to walk through it. Uh, the town suddenly made a claim that it was um, a public road right, running right through my property. And I found myself facing a Supreme Court case. And the, court, the, the case was simply to establish the ownership of this little piece of property here. It took three years, and uh, I won the case. It cost the town $40,000. So everything is, in effect, remained exactly as it was when I moved in here, except that I had the aggravation for three years. This, this property became so important uh, that the um, Conservation Authority were given funds to acquire it. So they have the management of it now. They did this in 1981. And uh, I continued doing the tours, but now they are the managers of it. I've been on, on some of Margaret's tours, and. I found the most reluctant outdoor person um, is enthused by the time she's finished. She doesn't just tell the story of Cave Springs. She questions her audience, and she draws them out to draw their own conclusions and figure things out for themselves. I began my tours within a year of me being here. Teachers who began to rent the camp next door immediately saw that I had animals and asked if I would um, let their children come over and, and look. They weren't tours, I just took the kids on hikes and told them about the little fragments of legends that I'd heard. But as the months and years passed by, I began to find out this was really a magic place. I found out about the magic spring, I found about the miracle of the ice cave, and the, um, the way this affected the children that when they could have a hands-on experience with these really fantastic natural phenomena. I'm concerned that when I'm gone, I wonder what will happen.
to this very special place of Cave Springs? Will it be thrown open to the public so that it will be trampled underfoot by vandals and um, trespassers? Already we've lost the carvings, we've lost the um, neutral uh, longhouse location, we've lost the magic spring has been covered up. We've lost everything that was uh, an integral part of this area and I just have to recreate it now with my tours. If you get poison ivy or insect bites or a nasty scrape or a cut, you just break that stem open and put that moisture on there and that will cure you. Now if you have a nasty scrape on your leg, this is the best band-aid you can get. This is called um, jewel weed or uh, touch me not. Now the reason it's called touch me not, and you won't be able to see it today, but this is fascinating. In the fall, it has a little pod grows the seed, and what we do is we get the children to each get one of these pods, and we ask them to show it to the teacher, and we ask the te they ask the teacher to touch it, and it bursts and scares them to death. <laughs> you can't conserve the environment. You know, I. Let's save the woodland or the, or anywhere here and do nothing to it. So when you do, when you save it, what happens? All the trees die of old age. It's going to change anyway. So really we're beginning to think now more about not just conserving a woodland or a wetland, but managing it so that it develops properly. The first thing I heard about here was the, man, was the ice cave. And uh, the man who sold me the property took me to look at it. And I was absolutely spellbound because it was September, it was very hot in 1970, and there was ice in there. And uh, he said, well, that disappears in the winter, and then it comes again in the... Uh, in, in the spring, it starts to form again. And this is, in fact, what happens. Everything that happens outside is the opposite inside the ice cave. And the magic spring is something else. Now, it is, it is magic, and uh, I can prove it. Look at me. I'm going to live forever. I'm wise. I'm going to... It's like drinking the fountain of youth. Makes you very strong and uh, healthy. And I'm like that because of drinking this magic water. So all the children then want to run and drink the magic water. Well, the proof of this is that when the um, United Church camp bought that piece of property, and they actually owned the magic spring, they had it analyzed, not just tested, they had it analyzed, and they found it contained magnesium sulfate, which is Epsom salts, which is good for inside and outside of the body. And it was also shipped into Hamilton and sold for its therapeutic purposes in the 30s. And somewhere out there are people carrying bottles still of uh, magic cave springs water. And of course the lost treasure cave, that is there, that's proof too. And I actually spoke to the daughter of the man who actually fell in the lost treasure cave. And it was Dora Grob, she was 77 years at the time. This was in about 1974. And she, used, she told me how she used to sit on her father's lap and he told her how he fell in the lost treasure cave and found all these artifacts. And in fact, she had one of them as a doorstop for years. It was probably a, a um, pestle for grinding grain that the Indians used. And also I spoke to a man who used to work here and he told me that when he put a grapery in, uh, just over the road there, uh, he uh, found it very difficult to plant the grapes because of the arrowheads that were in the way. And he picked them up in buckets, which means that there was an arrowhead maker sitting right there. And I know exactly where that location is. And he was a neutral Indian. And these people were annihilated in 1650. So this is very old um, history we're talking about here. In a recent editorial in Harris Smith Country Life, John Barstow said, Trees make comforting symbols because they live long enough, but not forever. And eternity frightens me. <laughs> a pair of old rock maples by a long deserted cellar hole connect me to a specific past, to the people four generations before me 
who planted the trees and attached to them their hopes. And yet planting a tree, if one chooses the site properly, can give one an anonymous sort of immortality. I think the most important uh, project that I have done, uh, the most popular, uh, has been the uh, starting of the Carolinian forest. Uh, two years ago, I began to ask for donations for tree planting at Cave Springs. So uh, this year in May, I raised enough money and I've started the Carolinian forest. Uh, I've got about 12 different species there. And this has become a very important part of the school uh, education program. The Carolinian um, trees uh, moved up here after the last glacial retreat 10,000 years ago. And they found um, these special locations in the valleys and at the base of the escarpment in sheltered areas. And um, they were able to, su to survive there. And uh, the, um, the fact that they are Carolinian species means that they are trees that are not indigenous to Canada. You will not see them anywhere except in these very special areas. And Cave Springs is one of these areas. These trees only grow in uh, sheltered, protected, uh, fertile, uh, slightly more temperate environment that we have at the base of the escarpment here, the same as there is in the Carolinas or Arkansas or down in the southern states. And um, these trees are uh, about three or four feet high now, but they will grow to 150 feet. So this is something for the future. Maybe it started a, a trend for saving the world through this Carolinian forest. The big problem is that we're egocentric. You know, we think we know. I, I used to walk into a class in the fall and, and say to the botany students, uh, nobody knows very much of anything about plants. How does the sap get from the ground to the top of a 300-foot redwood tree. What we do is invent a mystical language that says it's the cohesion of molecules, which doesn't mean anything. What we should say is we really don't know. So I had a six-year-old the other day. He said, tell me, where did you get the seeds from for these trees? I said, well, I didn't buy the seeds. I bought the tree. But they said, well, where did they get the seeds from? And it's the question of which came first, the chicken or the egg? How do you explain to a six-year-old this whole secret of, uh, of life, which is what it is, isn't it? See, genetic engineering is, a, is an explosion that's going to change humanity. That and the computer, the information age. So ahead of us, we probably have the most exciting time period that humanity's ever lived in. And I hope to make uh, I, another 20 years, you know, uh, myself, so, because I want to get in on some of this stuff. This is Pie Wicker. This is my Siamese uh, cat. She's a seal point. Uh, Pie is a very special name, and Wicker is Old English for witch, so she's little witch, aren't you? This new a uh, man putting himself back into nature and getting rid of this idea that nature is in your left hand and man in your right and they're fighting each other. When the facts are that man is just as natural as a tree or a star or, or a, a frog in, in the pond. I feel as though I'm feeding the universe, actually, because I have horses, chickens, cats to feed, and um, all the animals up in the bush, of course, get all the scraps. Anything organic is just thrown into the bush, and the raccoons, 
and the foxes and the groundhogs uh, get everything. But um, on a day like this, of course, it seems so easy. You just put out a bucket of water and the horse eats the grass outside and uh, you throw some grain to the chickens. But when it gets winter, it's a little bit different. I've had to um, get from here down to the barn uh, across sheer ice or through a snowdrift and um, have to break the ice out of the buckets and uh, carry the grain across to the chickens over sheer ice. It's sometimes like going over a skating rink. It's very hazardous, but this has to be done twice a day. I have to get all the grain in for the winter, the, the oats and the sweet feed for the horse, the bran, etc., and the chicken feed. And the hay has to be got in and stored in the barn. That has to be thrown down in the winter and fed to the horses. A lot of carrying and lifting. And um, I, so I feel as though I'm feeding the universe. I'm the last one that eats. So, natural man. I'm in the process now of um, writing an historic document. It's in the form of a book about my experience at Cave Springs. And um, every single thing that has happened to me since I've been here is um, going to be written about. When I retired, I decided I'd like to write. So I did a book, and then I started to do magazine articles. And the, it's a funny world. I got up over a 1,000 magazine articles, and that got me into who's who in America and who's who in the world. Now I, I'm trying to get into who's who in Grimsby's. <laughs> There's a price to pay for the good life that we live. And I'm prepared to, to try, even although I came here screaming, I'm now convinced I should make a greater effort. I still belong to the Planetary Society. And I just contributed so that on the next uh, unmanned probe to Mars, my name is going to be on a micro dot that will be left permanently on the planet Mars. So, you know, so at some day, some future explorer is going to stumble across this and He's going to say, who in the world was John Pierce? <laughs> fairies. Who believes in fairies? I believe in fairies.